So why are people the way they are? Nature versus nurture. Who's really in charge of this show? All right, before we tackle this question, there's a few things we have to understand. The first is that we're biological animals. If you're not working within the humans are animals context, I don't have much for you in this video. Second, nature and nurture are both required. You need a genetic makeup and you need a place, an environment to manifest in. Gene environment interactions are such that it's not meaningful to ask what a default person would be like. What would a person be like with no environmental influence? That is not as coherent as you might think. And finally, if we want to ask the question, nature or nurture, we need to ask it in a coherent way. And the most common way to do that is to find multiple organisms, identify a trait that's different between some of them, and ask why. Why is this difference here? Why aren't they all the same? For example, you might be taller than someone else. Why? Your family as a group might be taller than some other family, or shorter, or more violent, or less violent. Even things like your family might be more musically inclined. Why? Some of these differences may be genes, an environment, a mix. Highly complex traits are likely to be a mix, but not all mixes are 50-50. 70-30, 90-10, 95-5. One of the more obvious examples of an environmentally caused difference is North Korea and South Korea height differences. North Korea and South Korea are highly genetically similar, but there has been a reasonably large height difference that's emerged between the two populations, and it really has to do with nutritional deficiencies common in North Korea. So most people say, hey, that's a very clear-cut, easy environmental difference. On the other hand, you have height differences between Danish men and Italian men. This is most likely genetic. We certainly don't see the same level of adolescent malnutrition in either of these countries that we do in North Korea. Another more obvious example of height differences really coming down to genes for the most part is men versus women, right? Women are just shorter than men. And it's not because they're systematically malnourished all around the world. They're just smaller. So let's look at this more deeply, and to do that, let's look at rabbits. Domestic rabbits are mammals, female, does, build a nest for their baby. They'll use things like twigs and grass, or in captivity, we give them hay. And also, late in the pregnancy, they'll pull fur off of their stomach, and they'll integrate it into the nesting material, and they'll also cover their babies with fur, right, after they're born. So let's say you have two does, they both get impregnated by the same buck, which is a male rabbit. They both have five kits in their litters. Doe A has two kits die. Doe B, zero. Let's say we go through a few more pregnancy cycles, and we consistently find that Doe A has a higher kit mortality than Doe B. Now, here we go. We have groups. We've identified a difference between these two groups, the kit mortality, we can ask, well, why? Why? Is it, is it uh, nurture? Is it nature? Genes? Environment? What's the culprit here? Let's say we investigate the nests that the kids are raised in. Doe B, she's got a nice nest. Doe A, ooh, her nest isn't nearly as good. Doe A maybe used as much hay, but Doe A hardly used any of her fur or integrated it poorly into the nest. Now, the obvious conclusion some people would make is, oh, so the nest environment for the kits is lower quality, so that settles it. The Doe kits have a worse quality environment. The difference in kit mortality is wholly environmental. And I understand that, but wait a second. It might be the environment to the kits, but that environment was constructed by the mother she does what comes natural to her. She's informed by her genes. And those kits actually have some of her genes. I was looking over this book, which I have right here. It's titled Rabbit Production. It talks about producing rabbits for fur, meat, and pets, as well as other uses. In the book, it talks about how when you're breeding rabbits, when you encounter does who are making poor quality nest or having other nesting problems like scattering, which is where they have their babies outside the nest, 
If they're doing it multiple times, it's best to cull them from breeding, so they're no longer part of your breeding stock. Rabbit breeders have known for a long time, you can engage in artificial selection to improve the nests in your rabbitry. Does who make good nests get to breed. Does that make bad nests don't. And if you have a doe who made bad nests, her kits, you don't put them in the breeding stock either because they're going to have her genes. You avoid a lot of this problem over time from eliminating some of the genetics of the bad nest makers or the scatterers or the cannibals. So those genes are less prevalent in your breeding stock. Ultimately, we have to understand that nest making is a behavior and behavior has genetic components. In humans, we have fields like behavioral genetics and evolutionary psychology to understand and explain many of the things about human behavior and why we think and feel certain ways. For some people, they like to think of their mind as wholly separate from their hormonal animal body, right? Either as some disembodied soul or a rational actor but ultimately, remember, in this talk, I'm assuming we've all accepted that we're a bunch of dirty animals. <laughs> we're influenced by hormones and all of the chemicals and all that. Various things that affect your body could also cause chemical changes that affect what you think, what you feel, and what you choose to do. So back to the rabbits. It's very easy to diagnose the death of the kits as, oh, well, it's an environmental factor, and dismiss the idea that the high mortality is due to genetics. But when we engage in selective breeding to deny the bad nesters the ability to pass on their genes, why are we seeing this decrease in kit mortality? The ultimate truth is the doe acted in accordance with her genetics. She did what her blood called her to do. And once we breed out some of that blood, some of those genetics, our problems get better. And similarly, humans create nests for their children. Maybe not out of hay, generally, but we still create our home environments in a way that pleases us and makes us feel like we're doing the right thing. You know, I remember reading a few studies. You can find these studies very easy. They talk about the number of books in a home being able to predict certain outcomes, generally intellectually in the children. Long story short, more books, better outcome, you know, smarter kids or something like that. But the number of books in the home is well within the realm of human nest building, right? You might remember if you're old enough, there was a time where encyclopedias were sold door to door, right? And door to door salesmen would go around selling these sets and some of their best customers were parents. Oh, your little Johnny and Susie are so cute. If you get this encyclopedia set, it contains a wealth of information that you could provide to your children and fill their young minds, really empower them. Right in your very own home, they'd have everything they need for their geography class. They'd be able to write reports for class projects. You'd be creating this wonderful environment to raise those wonderful kids. And all you need is this high quality encyclopedia set. You'd be such a great mom or dad for creating this high quality nest to raise your kids. And hey, it worked, right? A lot of parents bought those encyclopedia sets. I remember when I was a kid, my parents, especially my mother, would take me to the bookstore. Not normally a new bookstore, but a used bookstore, which is fine. You know, new books are kind of expensive and generally contain all the same words as the used books. But I'm sure on some level, my mother felt that she was doing the right thing by bringing me to a used bookstore rather than, I don't know, the arcade. And even if you had parents who had no money at all, even for used books, you might be able to convince them to rent one apartment or another because it's so close in proximity to a library or something. Or maybe some parents you can't. Maybe they like legitimately don't care. Doesn't this come down to some sort of nest building impulse? I mean, some parents genuinely felt really great about what they did with that buying that encyclopedia set. But maybe not all parents are that same way. So much of what we think of as our environment, as being this sort of large, immutable, untouchable circumstance, 
A lot of that is a product of our genetics, or at least partially a product of our genetics. People fill their houses with the stuff that they are called to fill it with. They also get on PTA boards and fill the schools with some of that stuff. People ultimately fill their cities and towns with the stuff that makes them who they are. The next generation is subject to that environment, but that environment was created partly by the genes they inherited, right? To make this more obvious, right? Let's say you took England, which is a part of Great Britain, that big island. If you take England and you teleported everyone in England to the moon, right? And you also removed all the buildings and it was all just sort of grassy hills and forests. And then you moved in a couple million Taiwanese people into England. They would create a new society in England, uh, but they wouldn't recreate English society. They wouldn't necessarily go and build the hamlets and the castles and the cathedrals and then make a new English monarchy, right? They wouldn't all start talking about a stiff upper lip and start speaking English, they would create a new Taiwan, right? It would be like Taiwan version 2, or something like that. It wouldn't be necessarily identical to Taiwan, but it would be very similar to Taiwan, more similar to Taiwan than England. If you put a bunch of Japanese people instead, it would look like Japan. And I hope for most of you that seems fairly obvious. Uh, if that seems to you like, oh, I'm not sure if that's true, they might not create the same stuff as where they came from. Well, let's, let me see if I can convince you. Would you agree that getting a completely blank land and forming it to what you want is easier than moving into an existing land where people already have an established culture and norms and then turning that into what you want, right? Because if, they, if they're still there, you can run into conflict with them if you want different stuff. Well, that's what we see now. So how many times have you seen in the United States or wherever you live, there's a city that may have an established culture. It might be uh, sort of a white American city or could be anywhere in the world. And then let's say if you have a bunch of Chinese immigrants, how many times have they created a Chinatown? These Chinese people know you have an established culture there but they don't want that. They want something more like what they want. And they know you've built your city or schools and all that in a certain way, but they don't want that way. They want their own way. They will actually push against some of the established forces to create sort of a small parallel society. They'll have a Chinese outreach group that talks with the city council. They'll get some of their own members on the city council. And they will find a way to create their Chinatown. They don't want your culture. They don't want your nests. They want to create their own nests, their own town within your town. You ever been to Chinatown in Oakland, uh, California? You know, it's got like everyone, you got all the signs in, no, I think it's all Chinese. But, you know, the, all the shops, they go with their holidays and the way they do things because that's the way they want it. They didn't say, well, now that we're in Oakland, we're going to act like everyone else here. They wanted to do things the way they wanted to do things, even when sometimes that may have caused conflict. Way more conflict than if you were just moving into an open field and starting a brand new city. So I hope with that we can all agree it's easier to make a Chinatown in a place where there's nothing rather than an established culture that might conflict with your Chinatown, trying to create a town within a town. So obviously, if we, if we swept England clean and gave it to someone new, the new person would turn it into uh, a, a, sort of their old home slightly different. Now, ultimately, there is more complexity here. We could talk a lot more about why different generations might express different phenotypes, dominant, recessive, as well as, you know, uh, the, the complex cultural issues, like almost like elites being genetically different than some of the people who they're sort of deciding what their life is like. <laughs> but ultimately, I don't want this video to go on for hours and hours. The idea I want you to consider is simple. When a person grows up, their home sometimes ends up feeling like their parents' house. And that might seem obvious to some. They'll say like, oh, you know, well, they taught me how to do it. Well, at the same time, there's so many people who rebelled against their parents. And then later in life, they say, oh my gosh, 
I'm, I'm my own mother, or oh my gosh, I'm turning into my father. You know, many people are sometimes surprised at how much they end up behaving like their parents or their grandparents, right? Maybe some of the reason your house is so similar to their house isn't because they taught you how to run your house. It's because their blood's in your veins. You know, you are building your own nest, not just because of what you learned, but because it pleases you to build it that way. And you have genetic components to your behavior, behavioral genetics. So many people leave their home, you know, when they're a kid, 18 or whatever, with the express view that they want to be unlike their family. And then they end up becoming just like their family. One study that I was looking at, children's resemblance to their biological and adopting parents in two ethnic groups, which specifically looked at intelligence rather than like vague personality and all this stuff. They found that the intelligence of the kid wasn't so much correlated with the socioeconomic status of the people who raised them. The adoptive parents' socioeconomic status didn't matter that much. The biological parents' socioeconomic status was more correlated with the children's intelligence. So ultimately, these kids, while they had lived in some environment created by someone else and had all these, you know, benefits or drawbacks of these people raising them, at the end of the day, they still had their biological parents' blood in their veins, right? That's who they are deep down in, in many ways. Even if a bluebird was raised by cardinals, it's still a bluebird, right? Ra being raised by cardinals doesn't turn you into a cardinal. Have you seen those kids raised by wolves? Well, they're certainly not acting like a normal human. They do not pass for a wolf at all. <laughs> you, you would be very hard pressed to mistake them for a genuine wolf. All right, so this video is long enough. I will mention this before I go. If you are very astute, you may have uh, noticed that North Korea and South Korea being genetically highly similar, but obviously they've produced very different environments. And, you know, that's right. It's very, very true. I can't get into fully explaining the complexity of that situation. I'm not sure if I or anyone else fully understands all of the complexity there, but... There is a lot more similar between North Korea and South Korea than you might think, even if the sort of end result is very drastic, right? Uh, they're both very highly group-oriented, not very individualistic. They're both very authoritarian and hierarchical in structure, right? Often, whether you're having a conversation in North Korea or South Korea, all the parties in the conversation know who is the better, right? Who's above the other. And you may or may not be allowed to make certain criticisms or statements to that other person. In reality, a lot of the differences between North and South Korea, um, you know, comes down to like economic and monetary policy that has led to starvation and stuff. And some of those economic and uh, uh, monetary policies, while they can have very drastic outcomes, the South Korean household and North Korean household are, they act so similar, right? Their home environment is so similar and all that, even if ultimately, uh, in terms of wealth, a South Korean household is so similar to a Scandinavian household. So you could think of it like this. Genetic groups, they have a range of outcomes, right? So like, here's what you are, and you have a range of things that you could live in, right? Things that are acceptable to you. And some of those things end up being much better than others. Some of those things end up with a lot more um, adolescent malnutrition than others. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure for every group, there are good outcomes and bad outcomes, things we would consider generally good and generally bad. But I wouldn't necessarily expect that all groups overlap on the same good outcomes, right? Like what's good for this group and what's good for that group might be different and what's good for this group might not be achievable by what's good for that group. We're just different. 